Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Hand and Lock webinar. This is the first webinar for 2024. I am Lizzie. I am the price coordinator for Hand and Lock. And this evening, I will be in the background answering questions. So anything you want to, to know, um, add into the chat box. If you want to start with just saying hello in the chat box and where you are, that'd be lovely so we can start seeing where you're all from. Um, this evening, I'm based in London. Um, and we have Robert Asan for our host this evening, who is going to take us through all the lovely questions and our special guests this evening. Oh, just bear with me one second. I can see Francesca who's just going to come in, who's also one of our um, panelists this evening. Francesca, could you just unmute yourself so I can put you on the panel at the front, please? Bear with us, everybody. Hi, Francesca, can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself, please? Hey, yeah, I can hear you. Hi, everyone. Hello, I can't see you though. Let me, let Robert introduce you, introduce everybody. You get started and I'll try and find Francesca. Keep your um, camera on, Francesca, and I'll find you as Robert introduces everybody. Sorry for the technicals, off you go. <laughs> I'm so glad Lizzie's here to do all the technical bit and I'm just here to do the talking. Um, first of all, hello, good evening everyone. I'm Robert Asson. I worked for Hand and Lock for 10 years as the um, communications manager and then ran off to study uh, art history and fashion history. And now they invite me back, which is very nice occasionally to host events like this. So first of all, thank you, Lizzie, for inviting me back. And thank you to all our guests this evening. And thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our guests and they're going to give you a little whoop whoop. Uh, and that's starting with Chi Young King. Hello there. Hi. And that's Francesca as well. Hello. Hiya. And Katie Tubbing. Hello. And Kate Pankhurst. Hello. Hi. Hi. So these are our four guests this evening and they all have experience of being in the prize, entering the prize and winning. And you're going to find out from them a little bit about the experience. But first of all, I wanted to take an opportunity to speak to each of them individually a little bit about their work, about their practice and about their experiences. So, Francesca, we didn't get a chance to say hello, but hello there. I'm going to start with you, actually. Um, you cast your mind back to the actual prize event. You and I had a lovely conversation. And at the time, I think I asked you uh, about the brief and I wanted to get more thoughts from you on that. So the 2023 brief was modern mystic arts and the power of colour. So that sounds amazing. Um, and what Francesca did, well, well, tell us for yourself, Francesca, can you talk a little bit about your inspiration behind your piece, The Tree of Life? Hi, yeah. So um, my main inspiration was Hieronymus Bosch's um, triptych painting, Garden of Earthy Delights. It's like this um, really beautiful triptych artwork of like creation and then kind of fall in Garden of Eden. And I based my concept all on that, the kind of really strange and peculiarness that Bosch had created in it. And I basically, my piece was called Angelic Scapula. So it was like the, my idea of what the cherubim guarding the tree of life in Eden would be, would be wearing, what would grow on their body. And uh, yeah, that was kind of my main inspiration. And when you read the brief for 2023, did you already have that idea in mind? Was it how did that work? Yeah, so um, the time I read the brief, I was also uh, finishing, oh, I don't know, I was starting my um, graduate project. So it kind of worked in tandem because the brief was all about mysticism and my project was about kind of like Christian spirituality and looking at like um, deeper meanings behind things and religious emblems. So there was definitely that union in the beginning and throughout, but it was like 
kept being picked up and then by the time that I came to create my piece it was like oh okay here's a moment like this is what I want to showcase so those thoughts were going on throughout as soon as I saw the brief and then it just nicely synced up in the end when yeah. I was making it as well it's kind of like fortuitous it was yeah. exactly <laughs> everything came into alignment yeah. um, I'm just seeing in the chat there a little reminder to everyone that's watching this evening that if you have any questions pop them in the chat and what's going to happen is Lizzie's going to pick out the questions and send them to me and I'll read them out at a Q&A section at the end. So that's questions about the prize, questions about the process. But what we're really interested in is questions about the people and their work and their prize experiences, because that's what they're here for. Um, I'm just going to jump to you, Katie. Katie, um, we spoke briefly before the call. Your work calls to mind um, the work of Barbara Kruger and the performance artist Lee Bowery. Um, how important is it for designers to look to the world of art and performance for inspiration? I don't know if I would use the word important. I feel like it's more something that needs to come naturally. I think if you, you know, if you force yourself to watch every single performance artist or movie that comes out, it's not going to feel natural or exciting. I mean, I, I discovered Lee Bowery when I was, 16 and I don't know I was just obsessed and it it was almost it was an obsession it, it didn't feel like research it felt like an addiction it felt like drinking lots of alcohol or eating something really delicious um so it felt very natural so it's almost like you're you're consuming these things and then it kind of grows in your mind it incubates I suppose it's yeah it's it's essential I wouldn't say it's important, it's essential, but it's it's more like eating opposed to seeing. Okay. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> it, does. It, does. it sounds like you're describing your process and yeah. I think other people might have a different process. Very but much so. If someone is that kind of, they get obsessed, they become very interested. How do you turn that obsession, that hunger into mm -hmm. a productive artwork? Let's say there's someone in the audience today that's that's been inspired by the 2024 brief, they've got obsessed with something. How do you manifest that into an artwork or, or a, a fashion piece? I mean, what I, what I do is I always start with the material. So I would read the brief and then I would see what material excites me and then keep the brief in my head. But I would say, let the material guide you first and then after go back to the brief. Mm -hmm. That's how I would do it. I always think that, you know, it's in your hands. You feel it in your hands and that's how it starts. So it's not a linear process either. It's very much a kind of back and forth. But I think the best thing to do is to just experiment, try stuff and use your hands as much as possible. Answered like a true artist. <laughs> uh, we've spoken a little bit about the 2024 brief there and I will speak about it in more detail later so if anyone's unsure what we're talking about with the 2024 brief we'll come back to that. Um, I'm going to ask a question of Chi Young next. Um, your, your works are quite figurative and there's embroidered bodies interacting and engaging with the canvas I'm just interested why you think that resonated so well with the prize audience. Uh, actually, uh, I, I'm, I am interested in a passion for pushing the boundaries of embroidery and fiber art. So I hope to my work serve as a bridge between traditional embroidery and innovation regarding fiber art or fine art. So in my project, uh, it stands unveiled. Uh, it embodies my intentions to, to excavating something deeper within uh, myself or in a word. So it's like a manifestation of my desire to be truthful and not hide my thoughts and emotions. So I'm trying to break free from the traditional limits of the scare frame like just a scare and embroidery brain. So I just challenged the conventional notion of like embroidery. For anyone that hasn't seen Chi Young's piece, um, the, the figures on the piece are interacting with the canvas and they're pulling 
in a part and 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 there's a real tension in it and for me that was quite interesting because so often we think of embroidery just as a surface decoration or in this mm. in the prize we often create sculpture pieces that's really interesting but the pieces rarely seem to be ripping themselves apart and I found that quite interesting with your piece Chi Young um, you were obviously at the prize event last year how was it seeing people respond to your work in person uh, actually in my work uh, I think the frame or like the frame and it's just like just so for it's like wood frame, it's like uh for me an extension of artist expression. So using that, I express the like tension and tip the figure that I express using embroidery. I can more express more strong like tension in my work. Thank you, thank you. Um, if anyone needs to see these pieces, obviously we can't show them in this presentation, but you're very welcome to, to click away and carry on listening to us and quickly look at the Hand and Lock website where all these pieces have been beautifully photographed and they are there in the price section. Um, Kate, hello there, Kate. Um, Kate, you're positively a veteran of the prize now, aren't you? <laughs> so as a veteran of the prize, I think, first of all, I think you're someone who can talk on what it is that drew you back. You know, you had that experience in the first instance back in 2021, but you came back in 2023. Can you talk, first of all, a little bit about that kind of, why did you come back? <laughs> why wouldn't I? You greeted me so nicely. <laughs> you gave me a um, uh, um Seriously, I mean, it it is wonderful to... Um, certainly at the time, I couldn't quite believe I'd won in the first instance. Um, but, you know, it completely vindicated my, uh, what I'd done is actually change career, etc., to do embroidery. Um, I used to be a graphic designer. Um, but I came back because having an artistic brief to work with and um, to, to kind of immerse yourself in and just let it wash over you and see what comes out from that um, is uh, really useful. I mean, because otherwise, I mean, we, we can, as embroiderers, depending on what you do as a, as a job, um, you know, you, you stitch things that are, you know, you're told to do, um, or, or you, you can kind of um, always be doing the same thing, you know, never trying to push the boundaries or, to kind of take in any more any any a kind of a, a different influence and a different way of expressing it. Um, in terms of embroidery, I mean, you know, it, it's um it's a skill, you know, it's a craft that we learn. Um, certainly at the RSN uh, and hand and lock, of course. Um, but then it's it's taking it one step further. So you know, I can show you the craft, but I you know show me the art you know show me the story show me the the emotion and the feeling and the the uh the dialogue with somebody looking at your work and what, is that what you think do you think that's something quite unique about the hand and lock prize in that there is this brief it draws people in there's so many different international expressions of art is that part of the appeal do you think yes absolutely and and the fact that embroidery you know, it is being recognised by hand and lock and, and and elevated to that art form and give, giving people a space to explore it as a, a, a work of art that is somehow elevated. I mean, for some reason, you know, for, for something that takes us thousands and thousands and thousands of hours to create, you know, um, it, it's sort of not recognised as an art form. I mean, maybe it's because traditionally it was like woman's work in some way. Um, this and is, therefore this is the just overlooked you know, in some way, even though it's an incredible um, expression. So the fact that you've given this showcase, you know, where it, it's, um, you know, it's it's looked at by industry experts and it's it's displayed in a gallery on plinths and on walls so people can come in and see it. You know, it, it's um, it really is um, creating something really exciting and special for for us embroiderers. So. Cool. So anyone watching this today, you've got an insight into 
a little bit of the experience and maybe the joy that being an, a finalist in the prize can grant you. Um, Katie, I'm going to swing back to you now. Um, uh, we have our veteran, but you were also a first time entrant to the prize. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just interested to get your perspective on what you expected the experience would be like versus the reality. Did it meet? Did it exceed your expectations? Well, I was rec someone recommended this to me and I'm not, I didn't study embroidery. I'm a fashion designer, but I love embroidery. So I said, oh, try it, go for it. I really didn't expect to actually be a finalist or go there. I was really, it was overwhelming. So it exceeded my expectations usually. Um, but I think for me, the best part was just seeing all these other people who dedicate so much time into making these finicky things because it is you know like Kate was saying it's hours and hours of your life mm -hmm. and it's it's like a meditation so to be able to be around all these people who understood that it was kind of emotional for me at, at the final seeing these pieces that because you can you can feel the hands and the touch and not not everyone can understand that so I think for me that was the most uh impacting thing I think all this room was completely full I mean we were <laughs> packed full of people it was amazing and the good thing about those people and this whole community and the people on this call is they actually appreciate and understand mm. embroidery. Um, I mean, I'm going to go on a little segue here, but a few years ago, I was in a, a very high end department store. I won't name the department store with a friend from Hand and Lock. And we looked at two exquisitely embroidered dresses and we knew which one had used uh, a hand guided machine and which one had been done purely by hand. But when you looked at the prices, clearly the people who worked in the store, clearly the buyers, clearly a whole community of people in the fashion industry actually didn't because they were priced wrong. And it's wow. like, even those people who, are, who should know better aren't really appreciating the work and valuing the garment accordingly. Um, so what I like about this competition, about this group of people is when they look at an embroidery that someone else might look at and go, oh, that, that's nice and walk on, they look and they look and they look because they really appreciate the work, they appreciate the hours and the difficult the difficulty involved. So hello everyone and thank you for that, that special knowledge because it really helps. Um, I'm just gonna jump over to Francesca. Um, so something different happened with you, Francesca. So you did very well. You took third place in the student textile art category for the prize, but then you got a lot of attention at Harrogate and um, in the knitting and stitching show. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was all about and, and how that felt? Yeah, um, so essentially I, um, this was actually before my, I knew about my, if I was a finalist for Hand and Lock, but it was uh, while showcasing at New Designers in July time or June time, end of June. And the Embroiders Guild uh, saw my um, project, my FMP work, and they, uh, Anthea, as who's actually a judge, um, saw my portfolio and decided that I should uh, exhibit my work um, as part of like the student graduates for the Embroiders Guild and we showed at Ali Pali, Alexandra Palace and then um, Harrogate and so it was a nice little sync up because then when <laughs> I came bronze for um, uh, Hand and Lock my piece was also on display at Harrogate in the um, Hand and Lock display and then I also had my own little uh, booth with my uh, final major project work as well so it was it was a great sync up yeah <laughs> so in terms of exposure obviously the hand and lock prize puts a bit of a spotlight on you so that the sorry for everyone around the rest of the world we affectionately call alexandra palace ali pally here in the uk <laughs> we're going to continue doing that um also, if for anyone that wonders why we call the Elizabeth line the Lizzie line, it's just because it's funny, okay? <laughs> but going back to you, having that spotlight, having a little bit of extra attention on your work, what's been the impact of that over the last year? Um, yeah, it's been really amazing, especially in, in the kind of niche of embroidery, because in those certain spaces, everyone's coming with such a love for the craft, such a love for textiles and handheld things. And so when people see it, they really appreciate like 
how much time has gone into it, like different techniques you've used. And it's just really nice when, you know, one creative to another, one like craftsperson to another sees it through, sees it, you see it through their eyes, especially because if you've been working on it for so long or like my project I've been um, doing for a year and then I kind of submitted it and you're creatively you've finished with it, but it's nice when someone sees it with new eyes and like mm. is able to read things about it without even reading your description. I just think that's really, really lovely and uh exposure wise it's just it's great yeah it's been like so many so much like instagram uh following which has been really lovely and i'm um, just kind of like connecting people online and it's it's again creatively it's just nice when um before you say anything like someone is creatively understands like where this has come from or like picks up on other th bits about it um so yeah it's just it's just really lovely experience i mean yeah. you just nice things said about their work like you can't really <laughs> well, that's what we, we all live for that I, I think it's really nice to see um people being recognized and because I think embroidery is often something that's often done solo in a degree of isolation you need some quiet you need some space and it's kind of like you finally get to go out into the world and 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 see other people and, and get that engagement with something that maybe you've been obsessing over for weeks and not really knowing if it's any good anymore because I know as a writer the more I look at my own writing the worse it seems and then I'll go away have a sleep come back and read it and I'll go oh, that's amazing did I do that you know and I think that's the feeling that you want especially when someone else comes along and says that is actually very good we all want that um anyway less about me um uh Chi Young I have a question for you I think you can probably explain a little bit of the process um, because it's not just the Hand and Lock Prize, it's also the Associate Awards. And you won, you were the winner of the Royal School of Needlework Associate Award for Innovation and Technical Excellence in Hand Embroidery. So what was, what did that mean for you? Yeah, actually, uh, it is a very uh, moment of immense pride and honour for me. So the experience with the and then a lot of fries and we are so off network means a lot to me. It's like a big thumbs up for the, my heart working. Um, actually, I, I wear, I'm still learning and growing as an artist and a student. So sometimes I worry about like if I'm on the right path or direction. Mm -hmm. However, I realize that my ongoing work is shaping my future very positively and happy so it's like a kind of sign or like signature that people appreciate my style of blending my traditional embroidery with innovation so it was very happiness so through this experience I feel more confident in mixing my embroidery with like 3D structure or mm -hmm. breaking the frame in my upcoming project. So I will hope to try new things without being afraid of my next step. Yeah. Have you graduated from Parsons or are you still? Uh, I'm still uh, studying. So on May, uh, I will I graduate. Wondered, I wondered having won the, the prize with the Royal School of Needlework and having come done so well in the Handelot Prize, do you go back to the other students at Parsons and be like, look at me, I'm a champion? <laughs> I don't know, but after graduation, um, I will study, not studying, just working in my yeah. work. Yeah. You're too modest. You're yeah. too modest. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take a moment just to uh, underscore a little bit about the Hand and Lock 2024 prize brief. So people at home watching this understand what we're talking about in this next section. So first of all, every year Hand and Lock has a prize brief and it's designed to inspire your creative processes. Now, not everyone is going to work in that kind of fashion. There might already be a student, they might already be working on a project they might read the hand and lock brief and it might influence them. It might just happen to sync up with what they're already thinking. And subsequently, they might enter the prize knowing that their piece is, is in alignment with the hand and lock prize. 
Alternatively, some people enter and their piece feels very far removed from the prize, but because of its excellence, its, its embroidery, its beauty, um, it will do very well in the competition nonetheless. So the prize brief is, is there as a tool to inspire you. Um, and I think it's definitely worth paying attention to and reading it, but obviously it's not the be all and end all. Now, the 2024 prize brief is called Traces of Transition, Embroidery that Illuminates the Layers of Our Lives. Um, I'm going to go to you, first of all, Kate, because um, Kate has is not only a veteran of the prize, but this year, 2024, she's going to become a mentor. And I couldn't imagine a better mentor. Please, can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about how you would approach the 2024 prize brief and what you hope to see as a mentor? Well, um, so this uh, traces our transition. Um, it's a really, really interesting brief um, and it's a really interesting way of looking at um, our journey of life, if you like. Um, so no, normally, uh, normally if, if we kind of think about our own history, you might think of it as we start here and then we go to another stop and then we make a choice, then we go to another stop and stop and stop and stop. So, I mean, or maybe that was how I thought of life, you know, journey, but but this one is, is that wonderful word palimpsest, which I've never heard of before. I'm Sorry, that was me. Here. <laughs> I'm going to, <laughs> we're going to do that drinking game. We have to drop the word palimpsest into a conversation, you know, in dinner somewhere. Um, yeah, but, actually, but, I might pause you there because there are yeah, probably sorry. a lot of people right now scratching their heads going, what on earth am I, I was about to say. What is a palimpsest? I was about to say. Um, a palimpsest is just a wonderful word and I used it because it refers to these ancient scrolls that were effectively written on once and then that was removed and they were written on again and that was removed. Mm -hmm. But of course the traces of the first text always existed. And it's this idea, palimpsest is a word that's used in architecture quite a lot. It's used in clothing, it's used in, in language. It's also, it relates to our modern idea of upcycling. And a palimpsest effectively just means the traces of the old are still there alongside the new. And, you know, Rome is a very good example of a, a natural physical place where there's ruins right next to tower blocks. And it's a city that is, its scars and its age live right there alongside, fully visible alongside the contemporary landscape. I'm going to stop defining my favourite word of 2024 and hand it back to you. Now, my new favourite word is <laughs> palimpsest. Um, so I was thinking about sort of, so the, this lin linear journey, if you like, which I was just mentioning. So instead of it being sort of horizontal, imagine turning it around and looking down it as if it's a, and the, with the layers, you know, so that where you start your childhood or your influence, whatever that are still visible in the background. And then wh wherever it is you are now, that's in the foreground type thing. So, I mean, it, it did it immediately said layers of organza to me. It um, lends itself immediately to textiles. <laughs> you can have that idea for free, everybody. I don't mind. Um, um, so, but it's, um, I was thinking that uh it's immediately it's story um that that's kind of how i operate um i like to be able to tell a story of some sort and you know in art i mean your own story or well, one's own story is is the thing that you're bringing to the party you know it's and it is your voice your artistic voice is, is your and your story are the same thing so um so I, I would kind of wallow around in those thoughts for a while, you know, because I mean, I, I really do believe in whatever persistent thought comes up in your mind, you know, it's it's there to be noticed. It, it's, it wants attention and it's an idea. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, like with everything, I, I, would I would just start picking up bits of fabric and stitches and just start somewhere. Or I tend to do lots of little quick drawing, like just very small ones, nothing finished just so if anything wa actually washes out of the my brain, you know, which is visual, you know, anyway, that I've got something down, you know, so um, that's that's kind of how I work. And then I'll, I will just follow, follow that thought, you know, and until 
until I've made something, you know, so, and, and I know by then, you know, because I've told a story, hopefully, <laughs> um, then uh, then the, the finished thing, you know, ha is redolent with meaning and redolent with meaning from your own soul. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm seeing some questions pop up about how you spell palimpsest. So <laughs> let's, let's put this to the test. It's P-A-L-I-M-P. <laughs> S E S T, and it, I dropped it in the chat as well. It's also in the 2024 brief, which is on the Hand and Lock website. So back to this question though about now you can't enter the prize this year. I'm very sorry, Kate. So it, it's wonderful to know how you would approach it, but you just you're not going to. Instead, you're going to be mentoring. Bearing in mind you you were mentored previously by Diane and Springle. What do you think you can bring to the mentoring process this year? Um, it was great being with Diana. I mean, she saw things that I wouldn't have seen in a million years. So I'm hoping that that extra, another pair of eyes, another way of looking at something is going to be really, is going to be able to spark something in, in the, in the minty. Is, is that the right word? Minty. Um, also, I mean, it support, you know, I mean, um, mentors of mine in the, in the past have just kind of talked me down off the ceiling you know where I it's exactly where you, you're working and working working on something and you think have I gone too far yes you know have I turned it into like a pile of rubbish now you know I've just done too much but that that mentor can be there just to hold your hand and say no you know you're okay you're fine you know so have you thought about this have you thought about that so we're, without in any way trying to take over a project you know it, it would just there as a a support another pair of eyes another set of ideas um maybe little suggestions um and things like just to keep the sparks going really with somebody and um yeah i i guess thank you guess that's what i'll do that's what you'll do so welcome <laughs> to the team um thank you. katie i i think as a someone who's working in fashion design and, and creating I, I'm just interested in whether you have client briefs, whether you write your own briefs, whether you respond to briefs and what your stages are. What is step one when you get a brief? Unfortunately, I don't have one answer. I think it really depends on the brief. If it's if it's a client and they say, OK, I want this and it's very clear what they want, then I would do some visualizations of that, send that to them. And then we go back and forth. So I would say first uh, sketching, drawing, um, even using AI imaging, like, you know, all the kind of stuff to visualize it. If it's more open ended, what they're looking for, then and you can kind of be more playful and push it a little bit. The same thing, you would go and do a drawing visualization and discuss it with them. In a case of getting a brief like this, where it's much more personal and kind of, yeah, I think it's your own journey to make. Um, I would probably go through it a few times and then kind of pick out what really resonates with me and what how I find I connect to it. I think that's a good point actually, because one of the things that I did as a little exercise just before this, was I went through the brief and I actually picked out certain words and the words were palimpsest, restoration, historic revisionism, upcycling, multi-layered emotion. And I think that's actually quite a good approach for a lot of people to take because there's so much in these briefs mm -hmm. and you've got to find what resonates with you personally and zoom in on those bits. The good thing about the brief is you can take it in a million directions every year. So I like that idea of, you know, finding what resonates with you and maybe as a practical exercise for the people watching, you know, go through it, get your highlighter out, underscore the things that resonate with you. Um, Chi Young, will you be entering the prize again? Did, what, did, what were your thoughts about the 2024 brief? Yeah, to me, uh, the in the brief 2024, uh, I have uh, my favorite word trade layers and transition like change uh, in my art project so for me change is very staying positive and finding joy in my life so it's like 
energy keep me moving forward and growing. So, in, and also in the brief, I saw that like, even though technology is always growing, I think I can adapt to it easily and it becomes a very natural part of my life. But in the brief, they consider the relationship between personal optimism and collective fear. It is very interesting part for me because I usually only focus on very personal things on in my in my life. But in this brief, I think it's very interesting. So I'm looking forward to upcoming work with relationship between both of them. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I think I've got a, a question about mentoring for everyone, um, actually. So any of our guests pipe up, but what kind of relationship did you build with your mentor and has it continued on since the prize? Oh no, this silence is terrifying. I can speak. I didn't want to speak on top of everyone. No, go on, Francesca. I, apparently all the others hated their mentors. <laughs> Um, I had Beatrice, who's really lovely, Beatrice Newman. Um, she has her own company called Karaoke, which does like crochet in work. And she just actually showed at like New York Fashion Week um, earlier in like the end of last year. Um, and so what I found was just like, um, for one, it's just always great to get like someone who's been in industry and see their perspective on things. You know, they've probably done what you're doing at some point and they can have gone through it and they can give you advice and it just is really helpful um but also um I just found it really um good like network wise as well and talking about like my kind of future and career after hand in lock or like what I want to do long term and I think she just helped me to have like some sort of focus and you know I think as creatives we want to like float and just make stuff and let things happen to us but it's like to have um a vision or a guide of like where you want to end up or what you really like pursuing and a lot of time that just comes from like experimenting and trying things out a lot but it's nice to have uh, a direction of like where you see things going because then you can pick up experiences or um that apply to things that are going to suit what your uh, skill set is or what kind of tick scratches parts of your brain and I just felt that really um, benefited me having that insight from from Beatrice as well not just to kind of hone in and focus on like my development of my project specifically although that was really helpful but also like wider me as a, a like a um, embroidery uh, designer or freelancer like what does that mean what does that entail or do I see myself as a textile artist it's all like questions that you that are important to like consider and and think about so yeah I love that and I love I love that I think Beatrice is just a wonderful person we've interviewed her on one on these webinars before and I love that she was your mentor and I love that you've continued with that relationship and I, it happens often I know people have even gone on to work with their mentors um uh, so uh, I think with the relationship between the finalist and the mentor it's very much up to you to make the most of it and, you know, take advantage of what information they can give you, uh, what guidance they can give you. So if you are entering the prize and you become a finalist, take advantage of that mentor. They're there to help. They're there to support you. Um, it's like the X factor. And, you know, you've got your different mentors all lined up. They want you to win. They want to support you and they want to they want to cheer you on right to the end. Did I just make an X Factor reference? I apologize. <laughs> I'm like I'm like twenty years out of date. Is that even still on? Can I also add to that that um, Hand and Lock have created the uh, mentor uh, part of this to actually support uh, the finalists through, but also hope that in the future you carry on uh, that relationship and it allows you to grow. Uh, in the future as well it's not just for six to eight weeks if you get on with them we really hope that it carries on and it, it gives you so much more in life as well it's not not a puppy for Christmas kind of situation no. <laughs> no absolutely true and yes like I said so many times over the years you hear about these fantastic collaborations that are taking place um before we go um and 
uh, go into the questions. And I know, Lizzie, you're going to talk a little bit about what's changed in the process this year. But before we get into that, I have one last question for Katie. Katie, mm -hmm. you have a celebrity Instagram follower who likes all your posts, the famous Milner Philip Tracy. Mm. Uh, what's that all about? Uh, he's my uncle, so yeah <laughs> okay well he's also a judge i know i know that, well. was, that was a whole thing okay <laughs> oh no oh no what have i unearthed okay, um, he did you like one of my posts once <laughs> oh good well we're all... <laughs> it was my robin I, the funny <laughs> thing is, like my best. <laughs> there's so many um there's so many celebrities and, and when i used to be involved with the hand and lock instagram that would suddenly like various posts and you don't realize it but they have these highfalutin fantastic amazing lives and some of them just really freaking love embroidery and that's where they get their calm and their peace and their quiet um, I'm not naming names, but there's a certain rock star, pop star who's massive, and she routinely likes Instagram pictures all over the Instagram. I think she'll she'll we need to get her as a prize mental. Um, okay, well, on that, let's move over to questions. Now, Lizzie's been curating your questions and sending them through to me. So I'm gonna start at the top. Okay, so this is a little bit about concept boards. So I'm going to direct this one to you, Kate, because I know you've got two years worth of experience. What advice could you give on what to include on the initial submission concept boards? Um, right. So um, try try to be um, try not to put everything on there because it's going to be chaotic. And the fact that what when it's submitted, you're going to be looking at them on a screen. I don't know what you. I'm not sure what, actually what you do with them if you. We we them. changed it now, so if yeah. you want, to, I I can cover that in a, in a bit. Oh, that helps. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I just tried to make them as interesting as possible with just a few words, just enough to point out what is on there. So. Yeah, you. I think you want to. You want to get noticed. So get noticed um let's have a look how would you recommend going about developing embroidery skills by incorporating the layering of different techniques and processes i'm going to direct this one to katie so i'll read that again katie how would you recommend going about developing embroidery skills by incorporating layering we know you're good at that of different <laughs> techniques and processes hmm I think it depends on what you're layering, what you want to layer, and what you want the effect to be. I would say just try it and see what works and see what you like. I mean, it's not a very good answer, but that's that's what I would do. I would just try it out. And I think it's, you know, the more kind of samples and materials you accumulate, the better. Um, but I, I think it's just a matter of, yeah, giving it a go. I'm looking through the questions here, but I think there's a few along that line of like, if you know multiple embroidery techniques, not everything is going to work next to everything else. So mm. <clears throat> I agree, if you are really layering and being creative, you've just got to give it a go, experiment, look at it, walk away, come back, think about it, but also stick with your guns. You know, mm. you're, you're creative people. Um, how... Following on from that question for you, Katie, do you have doubts as a creative person when you're putting everything together? How do you get over that? All the time. It's really difficult because um, everyone responds differently to things. And some of the stuff I do is a bit weird and a bit out there. And then you always get the question, who's going to wear this? And then you kind of have to go into a whole, you know, sometimes you don't engage. But it's also a really good question. So yeah, of course I have doubts, but yeah, it kind of comes down to, I really love doing this. And that for me is enough to get over those doubts. I think so many people do this for themselves. And yeah. that's why they're so good at it because they're not doing it for other people. And that's that's kind of part Lately. of the key. Um, Now I'm gonna direct this question to Chi Young. Where was your piece in terms of how far along were you completed? Were you at the point where you were doing your digital submission? Um, uh, for me, I usually research the physical experiment. 
because I I think embroidery is very important to deal with tension with brain. But in my work, it is hard to deal with like tension because after embroidery, I cut the background yarn, background the fabric. So that is why uh, I think it's very important to research mm -hmm. and experience uh, that. Yeah. When you um when you were physically uploading the images of your work, was your work finished or were you still working on it? Uh, actually, my uh the last project, I have a lot of stuff, so I have very small series pieces. So after finishing this pieces, I almost the artwork and then I develop or I combine with knitting or embroidery or using combining a lot of layers in the fabric yeah so after completing my work pieces I always my work it, it sounds like you were doing it right up until the last moment and that sounds typical I know a lot of embroiderers it's the work is never done <laughs> um, I think a, a really good question has come through here um, with the brief leaning towards recycle, reuse, layering, would a fashion entry have to be entirely constructed from scratch or could elements of secondhand clothing be used as a base? I'm going to try and tackle this one, actually. Um, I think part of this idea of palimpsest and layers really kind of asks and almost demands that you use things that exist and that you are recycling and adapting and incorporating things. So I would think if you are entering the prize in 2024, sorry, 2024, yeah. um, and you are entering the prize category and you're really wanting to interpret the brief, I think you should be trying to play with existing materials and see what happens when you add old to new. In terms of doing things from scratch, I think a lot of people think with with embroidery that you have to do everything. You're supposed to make the garment, do the embroidery. I think the we're we're interested in the embroidery. So um, if you take a pre-existing garment and apply embroidery to it, that's just as valid. If you even utilize the services of a tailor to do an element of the garment while you focus on the embroidery, that's still valid. We're interested in the embroidery and your concept and your concept doesn't have to be you know you trying to tailor the perfect pair of smoking trousers if that's not your skill so um lizzie yeah, are there... the embroidery. yeah the embroidery. The embroidery. <laughs> lizzie were there any other particular questions here that you wanted to address i know there's some practical questions around timing and and things like that i've uh, you've covered everything, and then I was going to cover um, when things are going to happen, basically. So, shall oh, I? This is your, this is your, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I'm going to share my screen, so just let me know you can see my screen. Oh, it's now gone away because I've been doing this, so bear with me. Oh, I can see your screen. I'm my sure. email, sorry. <laughs> you can see, we can see. <laughs> We go that's what I want now can you see that yes this is Ji Young's work actually so you can actually see uh what she's created uh this is Katie Tune's work thirty six thousand dollars did everyone clock that mm -hmm. that is the price friends that will be spread across um let me think about this. There's three three in each category that will get uh, a prize. I think um, what Lizzie's trying to say is oh, you're exactly. not going to win the whole fund for yourself. It's still <laughs> not an insubstantial <laughs> amount. No, but if you come first, you do get a significant watch. Yes. It's well worth joining in. <laughs> Let's have an entire other webinar just talking about the economics of the prize and how much... <laughs> Sorry, Lizzie, I won't interrupt again. Carry on. That's all right. That's all right. 
So um, first part of uh, being part of the prize is registration. So if you go to our website, there is a link uh, to join the prize. Um, so to participate, you must register before Wednesday the 3rd of April. Uh, there are two types of entry. You can either be student or open. Student category is for everybody that is still in full-time education at the moment of entry. You do not have to be student um, when the prize um, goes ahead, so to speak. So it's just at the moment of entry. So if you're a student now, you enter now, that's fine. If you're out of education, you are ca your category is the open. Um, then on top of that, your second choice is fashion or textile art. So fashion is a complete uh, look uh, that you have created. Um, we like to see if you're going for a dress, it needs to be something that's completely covers you or if you're going for a top we need you to pair it with trousers or a skirt set whatever you're going to embroider it needs to have a complete look I know that some of you in the chat were talking about the sizes the size for this is a size eight uh, we do this because all of the mannequins that we have um, at the exhibitions are that size and it allows to make everything look fitted and perfect uh, we don't go any smaller than this because it doesn't fit on the models. And obviously, if we go up, then it's going to hang differently on the models as well. Um, so we say a size eight. I know that in the world that we are in now, that that possibly isn't, you know, the perfect size for everybody. But we have to choose something and go with it. And this has been the size uh, that Hand and Locker has been doing for the last I don't know, 20, 24 years. Uh, it's been running cool. there. We've just, we're just, we're going to stick with it. So bear with us. It's not, we're not sizeism. It's just something we've got to choose. Um, the textile art category is for everything else. This can be 3D models. It can be flat. It can be art. It can be a piece of clothing that cannot be worn wholly on its own. However, I would recommend that you avoid going down the area of just producing one piece of uh, costume wear on the basis that the judges are now liking to see uh, a complete uh, fashion piece. And they think that if it's a piece of clothing, it should be in the fashion, fashion category and not the textile art. So word of warning, if you go down that route, it's possible that um, you won't be seen favorably. So just heads up for that one. Um, at this point, we don't need you to submit your work at all. You just need to register um, and you can crack on if you've already got a decision on what you're going to do. You don't have to submit anything. So the online submissions are between the 3rd of April and the 5th of July. So online submissions are after step one, and we're looking at you submitting four images online. Um, and these will give us a beginning, middle, and end of your work. Um, we suggest that while you're creating and, and um, making your pieces, you, you take uh, lovely photos. These need to be clear and crisp um, uh -huh. when you submit them. They need to be square and saved as a JPEG. So I'm just going to show you what we're looking at. Uh, this is a submission from one of our finalists. So your first image is your starting point this year. Uh, this is your beginning of your design. It shouldn't be a Pinterest board as this is your starting point. So you, in your own mind, should be making decisions on what you're looking at. You can create a Pinterest board, but it would be a wasted photo if you're going to use this um, as your first photo, because this is what we want to see. So um, this is our, one of our entries and finalists from 2022, and her perception on the brief in 2023 
uh, she took um, the part that said power of colour. And this is her aura. And she had her aura photo taken on different days and she produced the same colours each day. So what we've done, what she's done here is showcase that, her choices of colour and a sketch of design. So as you can see, it's not a Pinterest board, um, but it shows where the beginning of the design has started. Um, this is the only photo that we will accept as a multi-image because moving forwards, there were too many multi-images last year and too much text. So text will be allowed to be entered on a separate uh, box when you submit. So you get a choice to upload your photo and then underneath you can write your um, information in there, which you can then describe uh, your connection and your beginning points uh, to the brief for this year. Uh, your image two should be the middle story. So images again will be one image. For example, this one here is a sample. Uh, this image may draw your samples, your progress. It will give the judges an idea of where you're heading, your middle of your story. Should you decide that during the design process that um, your work isn't going in the same direction, you can add that into the, the narration and the text as well. So if you started in one place and whilst designing, you've moved on to something else, you can also showcase that as well. Uh, image three will be a close-up of your work. This is something important that you feel the judges uh, should see. So it could be a technique, it, should be, it could be something that uh, narrates your story that little bit further, it's details of your work. It's something that's valuable to what you want to present. Again, don't submit multiple images. I've just kind of put both of these on so you can see what I mean by a detailed shot here. And then your last image, fingers crossed, will be a finished piece or work in progress, because I know that some of these pieces need a lot of work going into them. Um, so if it's not complete, we would like a clear idea of what your final design will look like. So for example, if this dress wasn't finished, uh, with the whole embroidery, you could still photograph it because it will give a good idea of where it's going. And again, in the text for each image, you will get a chance to narrate um, about your work your, your, and where, where you're at with your progress as well. Um, each box of text will allow you to submit 200 words. So it will look like this. You would submit a square image and then the text will lay down the side of it. You do not need to add the text yourself because uh, the judges just can't read the size of the text that comes through with the images as well. Um, please note the judges will use these images to determine who goes through to the next round. So it's vital that they understand your overall vision. So please ensure the images are in focus and not too light or too dark. So we'd love to join you to join us this year for 2024. And as you joined us for our webinar this evening, we have a special treat and we are giving five pounds off all of the entries this evening. So, uh, if you're a student, the entry fee is uh, normally £19. And if you use the code PRIZE5, uh, the fee will be £14. Um, for an open category, because you're now not in education and maybe got a job, uh, we uh, the entry fee is £29. And with the discount code, it is 24 I'll just leave that up for a moment while people scribble down <laughs> prize five. And this will be available until Saturday evening and it pops off at midnight UK time. So make sure if you're going to take advantage of this that you register in the next couple of days. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Lizzie. Okay. Um, the last thing from me is just going to be 
cementing it clearly in everyone's minds what the judges want, because remember, they're the people that you want to impress. So it's simple. One, technical skill. If you're good at embroidery, show them you're good at embroidery. Execution, make sure it's executed well. Your concept, whatever your idea is, deliver your idea, make it clear what your concept is, tell them the story. And then finally, and I'm sure all of the entrants who are the my guests this evening can attest to this, you've got to deliver some wow factor. And Kate, Katie, Chi Young, you know, you guys never fail to deliver. Francesca never failed to deliver um, the wow factor. Sorry, Francesca, you've disappeared from my screen. <laughs> I'm just trusting that you're still there somewhere. Go there ahead. you are. There you are. You know, these guys delivered wow factor, which is why they took home the prize. So be thinking of those factors. Obviously, you all need to get off this call now because you need to quickly go to the Hands and Lock website and register, type in prize five, save yourself some money. Um, but I think all that I want to do beforehand is please can we all thank our lovely guests and Lizzie for organising this. So we can't hear you, so just wave. Yeah. And thank, <laughs> thank you, you very so much. Oh, thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.